Hey guys, how's it going? It is um, at the end of the day and it's a little overcasty, so we're gonna try to get through this really quick, which is probably gonna be very easy because I did four videos this week. <laughs> um, we ended up taking two days off. Well, one day I told you guys about and the other day I did not tell you and I'm sorry. <laughs> I just kind of did not have the energy to finish editing a video and get it uploaded. So I had it filmed, I did not have the energy to finish the project. We did four videos this week, super easy. We did the Q&A, which we ended up doing at one of the nurseries. We did that at the plant barn, which was pretty cool. Um, and then we did, we had Bloom's a seed room tour, which I was excited to show you guys that because I had a lot of questions about that room and how we do our whole setup. And then we did the winter rose care, cutting our roses back. And then we did the video you don't want to miss, which was the bootstrap farmer giveaway. I'll be picking the winner the day that you guys are seeing this at some point <laughs> during this day, the winner will be announced. So while I'm filming it, I have no clue who it is, but the winner is going to be announced at some point today. So let's jump into the questions because this is going to be extremely fast and there aren't that many of them. So let's just get into it. First video that we did was the Q and A from last week and it was, do I get fan mail and what's partnering with a brand mean? And um, I think I just pulled two or three questions from this video. So, first question on that video is from JRP, and they had said, you said your garden plans may change. I'm curious to know what you're thinking about doing. Before you talked about creating garden rooms, is that still part of your plan? If so, have you ever checked out Murphy Garden in England? I have not checked them out, but I will be after this. Um, and the garden plans are, I think they're gonna change. So what I was gonna do was very formal, and I was gonna have like quadrants in it. I still want rooms in the garden. I want it to feel very cozy. Um, but I think I want to do like a meandering pathway through the garden and then like bring in touches of formality. This garden just doesn't feel, as we were getting into it, like very formal. I was going to do four quadrants and it was going to be very like structured. I don't think that that's what this garden wants. Um, it just is a very long garden. It's not very like wide. And so there's not enough room to be able to, I feel like do that and execute it where it feels comfortable to still be able to like walk through everything. So we're gonna change it. I still wanna do rooms, but we're gonna do like a walkway with like a seating area and then a walkway around and just kind of like a pathway that you can just kind of like slowly like lose yourself while you're walking on it. Next question on that video is from Heidi and she had said, hi Robbie, I appreciate you thinking of your viewers possibly getting burnt out on hearing about Vigo. Like you had said at this point, anyone watching both you and Janie is fully aware of the company and their great products. How about partnering with Harley Botanic? <laughs> If anybody can get me that sponsorship, just go right ahead and send them my way because um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. That would be absolutely amazing. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I'm on their level yet. <laughs> but if you, uh, if you know someone, if you've got a connection, feel free to hook me up. Last question on that video is from Rhonda, and she had said, "Anybody know Robbie's birthday? Let's send lots of cards to him. It's April 12th." And I love birthday cards. <laughs> I love celebrating my birthday. I know a lot of people hate celebrating their birthday. I love it. I, I enjoy it. It's a day about me. I get to do whatever I want. And I don't even get to hear anything from Brent, even though I do that every day, but especially that day. So April 12th, if you want to send me a birthday card, I love birthday cards. I love cards. I love opening up mail. So feel free to send me a birthday card next video that we did was we have Bloom's seed room tour and um, there were some pretty good questions on there I think this video is the one no the next video is the one that I pulled the most questions from but still a lot of questions on this so let's get into this one the first question on the video is from the swan and they had said have you ever seen considered treeing up your coleus I recently saw photos on Pinterest and they're really cool I just saw photos on Pinterest just the other day of somebody turning it into a topiary I think I'm gonna try it um, because they're already like a good size. So I might do that because that would be amazing. I do think that they need to be taller. So what I might do is like let some of these grow. Like I'll take a cutting of one and I'm gonna see if I can turn it into something that's very tall because these ones have already been like kind of pinched at the top. And so they're starting to get bushy where I want one that gets some height and then like forms a topiary on the top. I'm gonna try it. Next question on that video is from Tom, and he had said, Robbie, I'm interested in getting some lights to start some seeds. I clicked on your Amazon link, and it brought me to some shop lights. Forgive me for my ignorance. This is my first attempt at this. Is there any difference between LED shop lights and regular grow lights? 
Okay, so um, they are shop lights, but they work amazing. And so the reason that things are considered grow lights is because they have a certain Kelvin, which is like how bright the lights are um, on your lights. And so like the Kelvin is very, very high for grow lights. And so those shop lights that I've linked have a high enough Kelvin in order to like make it so plants can photosynthesize if that makes any sense. Uh, and then there's there are ones that like all kinds of brands like label as grow lights because they have like a red light or a blue light and the plant needs all of these things. Just buy the cheap shop lights. I think it's I think they're on sale right now for like $55 for it's either like six of them or 12 of them. And then we use two lights per shelf. Personally, we probably should go up to like three lights per shelf, but two works just fine. Um, so. There is a difference between shop lights and grow lights. The shop lights can be grow lights if the Kelvin is high enough, if that makes any sense. We've been using ours for years and they work really, really well. Next question on that video is from Marla and she had said, do you deal with fungus gnats in your seed starting trays? Can you recommend anything to kill them? Use the Midex. We use that and then we also use those little sticky traps that are shaped like butterflies and like flowers. We use Midex and it works really, really well. You do have to stay on top of it to like bring that population down. It also takes care of like aphids and spider mites and anything that you may be dealing with. The Midex works great for the fungus gnats and then those little sticky traps also work really, really well. But you do need to use quite a few of them. Like I have two up and honestly, I probably like could have eradicated the problem faster had I put like six of them up. But they are very sticky and they will get stuck to your seedlings. So that is something to be careful. Next question on that video is from Elaine. And she had said, where do aphids come from? Are they in the soil? So yeah, their eggs can be in the soil. Um, those are ones, the Euryngium I brought from outside in Escabiosa. And so they had already formed up. They might have already had little aphids on them when I brought them in. And then the population just kind of like grew and got out of control. So they could come from that and they could come from just the potting soil. But I'm pretty sure they came from already me bringing the plants from outside inside. Next question on that video is from Sandy. And she had said, thanks for the tour. Brent did an amazing job on the window and we just put the blinds up. It's even better now. <laughs> um, are you watering your seeds from the bottom? We bottom water everything. Any houseplant gets bottom watered. That way we don't have to like worry about putting too much water in and then it like spilling over the like tray that we use um, or anything like that. That way it can like soak up as much water as it wants. And it buys us a little bit more time in between watering because I hate watering and we're not very good at like keeping up on it. But all my seedlings get bottom watered. I fill that tray up, probably about that much water, and then I leave them and it soaks it all up, usually within like two days, and I let it stay in there. They say you're not supposed to because you could like rot your plant, but I have yet to do that. So that's the way I'm gonna go for it. Last question on that video is from Joy, and she had said, hi Robbie, you mentioned that some seeds that need to be really close to grow lights. Can you tell me which ones or where do I find that information? The best place you're gonna be able to find that information is on the back of the seed packets. Um, things like coleus and lisianthus, begonias, and a few other things that need light to germinate. And you wanna keep them as close to the light as possible so that way when they do germinate, they don't all of a sudden start stretching and reaching for it. If your grow light is here and your seeds are here it's trying to reach that and so your seedling will get really stretched out and really long so it's, it's best practice to like keep them you know within a couple inches of the grow light but certain things need the light to germinate and so you have to keep the light close to them otherwise they're not going to germinate very well next video that we did was a winter rose care and um cut those roses back hard <laughs> it was good uh they're all budding out so that's exciting i was just looking at the silver lining I just realized I forgot to do the rose right next to the silver lining. Mm hmm Oh my gosh, the honey apricot rose, I forgot. We have so many roses on this property. And there's still more that I want. <laughs> oh, okay, well I have one more I have to defoliate. We'll see if it happens. Anyways, first question on that video is from Peggy and she had said, I gave up on roses due to sawfly larva, also known as rose slugs, although not related to slugs at all. Um, they eat the tissue of the leaves so that the leaves look like lace. Do you deal with that? And then I forgot to expand the question while I have it as a screenshot here. So anyways, I remember you said, um, do you deal with that pest in your garden, I think. <laughs> um, we don't deal with that. That sounds absolutely awful. I've heard of a few other people that have dealt with it. Um, 
and I've heard that it like will like cut your plant also. It'll eat the base of your plant, and then like your plant will just be like chopped off. That sounds terrible. That sounds terrifying. I definitely would not grow roses if I dealt with them um, and they like were a big problem and like could not be eradicated at all. I don't know how you would deal with that, I'm sorry. Next question on that video was from Grace's Home and Garden and she had said, hi Robbie, just wondering, have you tried propagating your roses? If so, were you successful? Yes, I actually have a bucket of roses right now in the side of our property. It's got, I think like five roses on it. <laughs> and funny enough, um, they actually, one of them produced a single rose off of it, which was really, really funny. So it is possible. Um, maybe I'll do a whole video on how to propagate your roses because it is so extremely easy. And I had, um, I think I did five of them. No, I did eight of them and five of them have made it is what it is. So, so pretty good propagation rate on those. I think it's an amazing way to get a ton of roses. That's how a lot of growers do their roses. Um, they just take tissue cuttings from it, put it in some soil, and then they take off. It did take a very, very long time for it to start rooting though. What I did notice was that the stem that I did cut had started to push out growth before it even started growing roots. And then I pulled one out and I cut the roots off on accident when I pulled it out and then I tried to it back in the dirt and it died. So be patient. <laughs> but yes, definitely possible. Next question on that video is from Susan and she had said, why do you defoliate? We defoliate our roses because we don't get cold enough for them to naturally defoliate. It's a really good way to give our roses a break from having to continue growing and trying to like produce seeds and produce flowers. It just gives them a minute to breathe and stop everything. Let them go into a little dormancy, focus some energy on the root growth and then be fully prepared to take off in the springtime. It really promotes a like healthier, stronger plant. And then also defoliating helps because I deal with aphids and I deal with spider mites in my garden. And so defoliating takes care of any of that pest pressure. And then if I pull all the leaves off the ground, it gets rid of all of those little eggs that are still down there. So it's a really big, important thing to do if you deal with any pest pressure. Um, and also if you're in a warmer zone where your plants don't naturally defoliate to give them a little breather. Next question on that video is from Dorothy and she had said, hello Ravi, I am intimidated by rose pruning. I get confused about the rules to follow. What would you say is the primary rule to follow in successful rose pruning? Just pay attention to which way you want a branch to grow. That is like the biggest thing. Um, I would say two things, don't take off more than a third and focus on which way you want to have branches grow. You don't want them to continue to grow inward. You'll get a bushy plant on the inside, but that can cause all kinds of pest pressure. Like that can cause like powdery mildew, so fungal issues, and that'll cause all kinds of like problems for like pest. You want your you want your rose to be like V-shaped, so you always cut so that way your buds go outwards. That way, you know, you keep it nice and airy and less pest. Next question on that video is from Robin, and she had said, why do you defoliate your roses? What would happen if you didn't defoliate your roses? I just went over why I defoliate them. What would happen if I didn't though? Ultimately nothing. Um, there's been years that I don't do it. I just forgot, didn't have the energy and it was on the bottom of my list. I just had the time and a little bit of energy to be able to do this project. Um, it's just best practice to give your plant that break and to take care of pest problems. I have noticed years that I don't do it. The pest pressure is a bit higher very early. I didn't do it two years ago and the um, pink iceberg rose was covered in aphids immediately. It was like April and it was like covered in them. So if I had defoliated it and cleaned up around the base of it, that probably would have bought me some more time and made it so it was much more manageable. That's why you want to do it. And what happens if I don't? Nothing really. It would be fine. Next question on that video is from Nita. And she had said, Robbie, my roses are in full bloom. You sent me a photo of them. They've looked beautiful. <laughs> um, the icebergs. Uh, I can't imagine being able to take off all those leaves since I use a walker. I will do my best. Proud of you because you sent me a photo that you did. Um, I have read rose hips take energy from rose production. Is this true? That is very true. And it is true for pretty much any plant. Anything that has gone to seed is taking energy away from the plant and it's telling the plant that it's almost done living and it's done its job because it has reproduced. So what's happening is it no longer needs to produce blooms because it formed enough seeds that it can you know, reproduce and create new plants and it doesn't need to continue doing any more of its job. So any plant that you have that is going to seed, 
you want more blooms, cut off the seed heads before the seeds form so that way the plant knows it needs to send you more blooms. That is the like biggest tip out there. You want more blooms, cut on your plant. Last question on that video is from Denise and she had said, hello Robbie, I am new to your channel. I saw you on Janie's channel. Where do you live and what zone? I'm a beginner with roses. I live in Jacks, Florida, zone 9A. I am a zone 9A also and we are in Northern California. Um, little tiny town called Los Molinas, like 2,000 people population, and we love living in a small town. <laughs> um, super small town, thanks for, thanks for being here, I appreciate it. Last video that we did was the video you don't wanna miss, and that was our giveaway. That was our Bootstrap Farmer giveaway, which was very exciting, because that is going to make seed starting for someone amazing. <laughs> it's gonna be something they will have for a very long time. Um, and I think there was only two or three questions on this video very few questions just a lot of people very excited at the time of filming this there are hundreds of you guys who have commented which is absolutely amazing so let's go over the last couple questions this week first question on that video is from deborah and she had said i plan on starting poppy seeds and snapdragon seeds what other varieties of poppy flowers do you have in your garden um, as of right now, there are zero poppies except for one that is an oriental poppy, and it's an orange one. It comes back every single year. I don't know the name of it. Um, it just keeps growing every single year from the same spot. And then we had grown this year Swan's Down poppy, and then we grew, um, it's called like Apple Tie Silk, which it was okay. It wasn't my favorite, but I, I'm not going to grow it again. It was pretty, the very few blooms that we got, but wasn't worth it. And the other one that we grew was um, one called Amazing Gray. And that one was amazing. There were so many blooms off of that. And it was the first one to bloom. They're very little blooms. They're small. They're, you know, I don't know, like that big around. And they're pretty. It's just four petals. But they're all different. They're all a very different gray color. And it's they're very, very unique, very pretty. I would love to grow them again in the landscape in kind of like a big, long drift. But they're short. Um, and they just continued to produce and produce and produce and produce. So that was really nice. They produced all summer long until we... Amazing Gray was awesome and the Swans Down is awesome. Those are my like two, if you're gonna grow cool poppies, grow those. And then I'm in California, we get poppies that pop up everywhere. We get those orange ones, which are just like very common. They grow along the side of the road, but we don't have any of those on our property, but Poppies grow really well here. Next question on that video was from Ginger and she had said, hi Robbie, I'm most excited to start blue poppies. I need to look that up. Have you heard of them? I have not heard of them. And I love poppies. I think they're so pretty and they're so unique and there's so many different like colors and shapes and sizes. Blue poppies, I will look into that. And the very last question this week was from Chris and he had said, I wish I could find quality products like these in Australia. Do they ship to Australia? Everything I can find in the store are flimsy and seem to be single use only being from Australia. We are reaching out to the middle end of summer. So excited to start my winter autumn crops soon. Okay, yes, they do ship to Australia. Um, I went on their website, it says they do ship to Australia and they ship to Canada. So if you're in either of those places, you're in luck. They do have a couple retail stores. They have one retail store in Australia. If you go to their website and then go under like, I think it's like the FAQs or something like that, it says like shipping internationally or finding um, international retailers. They have one in Australia and I think five or six in Canada. So quite a few places. I mean, that's not that many places, but you know, some places you can find them. You can also order it and they will ship it internationally. They did say that shipping is very expensive. Um, and so they recommend going in with, if you have friends that want to place an order, they recommend doing it that way. So it's a bigger order. So shipping and customs and taxes and all those things don't cost nearly as much, I guess. I don't really know how that works, but yes, they do ship internationally, um, but it is expensive. And then, like I said, they have a couple local stores. So I hope that helps. And um, they said that they will also let me know when their back, the ultimate backyard seed starting bundle gets back in stock because it is sold out. <laughs> so they'll let me know and I will let you guys know when it gets back in stock because either way, that's an amazing deal for that much seed starting supplies of high quality that you'll never have to buy again. You know, each year you're gonna spend $30 on seed starting supplies, might as well just do a one-time big purchase. So that is gonna be it for this video, you guys. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming along with me. I'm feeling a lot better now. Um, 
at the very tail end of this sickness. So hopefully by the middle of this week, I'm up back to 100%. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.